of all the pending issues. Professor Norman Finkelstein. Well, I'm going to try to focus on the key points. There are issues about the refugees in Jerusalem, which for now I can't get into, but I would be happy to return to them later when we discuss what was the impasse at Oslo, excuse me, the impasse at Camp David and Taba. But I want to set the context, and I don't think I agree in part with the context that Dr. Ben-Ami set out, but not fully. The main context, in my opinion, is as follows. Since the uh, mid-1970s, there's been an international consensus for resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict. Most of your listeners will be familiar with it. It's called the Two-State Settlement. And the Two-State Settlement is pretty straightforward, uncomplicated. Israel has to fully withdraw from the West Bank and Gaza and Jerusalem in accordance with the fundamental principle of international law, cited three times by Mr. Ben-Ami in the book, his book, that it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war. The West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem having been acquired by war, it's inadmissible for Israel to keep them. They have to be returned. On the Palestinian side, and also the side of the neighboring Arab states, they have to recognize Israel's right to live in peace and security with its neighbors. That was the quid pro quo. Recognition of Israel, Palestinian right to self-determination, the West Bank and Gaza with its capital in Jerusalem. That's the international consensus. It's not complicated. It's also not controversial. You see it voted on every year in the United Nations. The vote's typically something like 160 nations on one side, the United States, Israel, and Nauru, Palu, Tuvalu, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands on the other side. That's it. Now, the Israeli government was fully aware that this was the international consensus, but they were opposed, A, to a full withdrawal from the West Bank and Gaza, and Jerusalem, of course, and two, they were for opposed to creating a Palestinian state in the occupied territories. Come 1981, as pressure builds on Israel to reach a diplomatic sub settlement in the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict, they decide to invade Lebanon in order to crush the PLO because the PLO was on record supporting a two-state settlement. As, as Dr. Ben Amid's colleague, Avner Yaniv, put it in a very excellent book, Dilemmas of Security. He said the main problem for Israel was, and now I'm quoting him, the PLO's peace offensive. They wanted a two-state settlement. Israel did not. And so Israel decides to crush the PLO in Lebanon. It successfully did so. The PLO goes into exile. Come 1987, Palestinians in the occupied territories despair of any possibility of international intervention, and they enter into a revolt, the Palestinian Intifada, basically nonviolent civilian revolt by the Palestinians. And the revolt proves to be remarkably successful for maybe the first couple of years. Come 1990, uh, Iraq invades Kuwait. The PLO supports, ambiguously, but I think we fairly can say, and I agree with Dr. ben on this, they lend support to Iraq, the war ends, Iraq defeated, and all the Gulf states cut off all of their money to the PLO. The PLO is going down the tubes. Along comes Israel with a clever idea. Mr. Rabin says, let's throw Arafat a life preserver, but on condition. And Dr. Ben Ami puts it excellently, that the PLO will be Israel's subcontractor and collaborator in the occupied territories and now I'm calling Dr. Ben-Ami, in order to suppress the genuinely democratic tendencies of the Palestinians. Now, it's true, exactly as Dr. Ben-Ami said, that Israel had two options after the Iraq war. It could have negotiated with the real representatives of the Palestinians who wanted that full two-state settlement in accordance with the international consensus, or it could negotiate with Arafat in the hope that he's so desperate that he's going to serve as their collaborator and subcontractor in order to deny the Palestinians what they're entitled to under international law. The Israelis chose Arafat, not, be, not only because Arafat himself was desperate, they chose him because 
they thought he would deny them what they were entitled to. He would suppress all resistance to the occupation. Professor Norman Finkelstein, author of Beyond Chutzpah, more from his debate with former Israeli Foreign Minister Shlomo Ben-Ami after the break. Latif Ali Drisi here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue today with the debate between Professor Norman Finkelstein and former Israeli Foreign Minister Shlomo Ben-Ami, since the outbreak of the latest Palestinian Intifada in the fall of 2000, the subject of what happened during the final round of peace talks at Camp David in July 2000 and at Taba in January 2001 has been the subject of much debate. The Israeli government and its supporters have blamed the Palestinians for rejecting what they say was a generous offer that would have given them a viable state. The Palestinians say Israel never made an offer that even approaches meeting their minimal rights. Each side has used the other's alleged position to assign blame for the violence that's plunged the conflict into deeper chaos. We begin this part of the debate with Professor Norman Finkelstein talking about the peace talks at Camp David in July 2000. My concern is let's look at the diplomatic record, the factual record. What were the, uh, what were the offers being made on each side at the Camp David and in the Taba talks? Uh, and the standard interpretation, which comes, which is, you can call it the Dennis Ross interpretation, which I think, unfortunately, Dr. Ben-Ami echoes, is that Israel made huge concessions at Camp David and Gaza, uh, Camp David and Taba. Palestinians refused to make any concessions because of what Dr. Ben-Ami repeatedly calls Arafat's unyielding positions and that Arafat missed a huge opportunity. Now, it is correct to say that if you frame everything in terms of what Israel wanted, it made huge concessions. However, if you frame things in terms of what Israel was legally entitled to under international law, then Israel made precisely and exactly zero concessions. All the concessions were made by the Palestinians, briefly, because we don't have time. There were four key issues at Camp David and at Taba. Number one, settlements. Number two, borders. Number three, Jerusalem. Number four, refugees. Let's start with settlements. Under international law, there is no dispute, no controversy. Under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, it's illegal for any, any uh, occupying country to transfer its population to occupied territories. All of the settlements, all of the settlements are illegal under international law. No dispute, the World Court in July 2004 ruled that all the settlements are illegal. The Palestinians were willing to concede 50 percent, 50 percent of the Israeli settlements in the West Bank. That was a monumental concession going well beyond anything that was demanded of them under international law. 